Welcome to my session. I'm Mark Heesman from Kanos, and uh, the title of my talk is Being Agile Business Survival Essentials. Agile is great, but on its own, it isn't enough to survive in today's digital economy. So using some examples from some of the leading companies in their fields, I'm going to talk about seven things pretty much every business must do now if it's going to stand a chance against the competition. Before I do that, a little bit about us, if you haven't heard of Kanos. Uh, we're a UK-based digital services company. We've got over 30 years' experience in software delivery um, and are leading a lot of the agile development happening in central government right now. Uh, we've also been voted one of the Sunday Times' best 100 companies to work for four years in a row and are currently ranked as number 37 which isn't bad for a company of 800 people. So that's us. Let's talk about Agile. Well, why are we using Agile? Um, does anybody recognize this man at all? And blank looks OK. Well, this guy is actually uh, Leon C. Meginson, who was the former professor of management and marketing at Louis uh, Louisiana State University. And he was actually uh, Meginson who said, it is not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that's most adaptable to change. In the struggle for survival, the fittest win out at the expense of their rivals because they succeed in adapting themselves best to their environment. And he was, of course, paraphrasing Darwin's thinking. We use Agile because it provides us with the ability to adapt to change, and we certainly need to. Since 2014, there are now more mobile devices than human beings on this planet, estimated at around 7.5 billion. More than half of the digital traffic now comes through mobile devices or mobile apps. 70% of people in the UK own smartphones, and apparently two-thirds of these people keep their phone by their bed at night. Actually, over half of them check their phones within five minutes of waking up. Uh, one or two slightly embarrassed looks around. Um, so technology is changing the way in which people behave and their expectations, and that in turn is threatening the survival of many businesses. So let's take a quick look at some of the ways in which customer behavior has changed through digital technologies. So customers no longer simply compare companies only with their competitors. When a company, uh, sorry, when a customer compares your performance, they're looking not just at your, your peers, but they're looking at their insurance company, they're looking at their supermarket, they're looking at their holiday company. And if one of those companies exceeds the benchmark of what they think looks good, they'll expect you to achieve that too. Customers are clearly less tolerant they become faster to complain. And that's perhaps due to the fact that actually it's so much easier and there's an anonymity to doing that through online services. Uh, they've also become quite harder to satisfy. And research shows the importance to customers of ease of service in particular. And that kind of reflects an expectation of increasingly personalized services designed around their needs, not the needs of the organization. Of course, customer-to-customer -customer dialogue has grown. Uh, social media and customer forums have huge potential both to build and destroy brands. And customers are led by the opinions of friends or followers, and those are corroborated by likes and testimonials of others. The reputation of a company can be shaken or strengthened accordingly. Customers are less loyal now. They no longer adapt, uh, accept perceived overpricing or poor standards of customer service and are open to switching provider. And they can do this really quite easily. They want value for money, not just cheap goods and services. And they demand quality and are willing to pay for it. It's true also that customers no longer accept branding and marketing from organizations. There's widespread cynicism uh, around mainstream information channels plus strong legislation against direct marketing, and of course, an increasing technical ability to screen out advertising messages altogether. So opinions and commercial relationships are now formed in different ways through different channels. Customers are, of course, more informed than ever before. Uh, it's given access to information uh, around products and services on a scale 
that actually hasn't been seen before. And the, the company no longer has the monopoly on their own uh, knowledge of the product. And in fact, all customers are becoming multi-channel users. Customers, not businesses, now dictate which communications will be used most. And if a business launches a new type, type of service, if it chooses the wrong channel, that, that service simply won't be used. So some of the ways in which customer behaviours are changing. And of course, that is driving huge changes as well. Digital, cha digital technology is driving huge changes in markets in every sector. The barriers to entry, really, uh, for both local and global markets have reduced massively. And here you can see some of the key differences between digital and traditional companies. Capital, particularly in developing markets, is readily available, actually, for, and investors are rewarding innovation and growth. If you take, for example, Slack, and I don't know how many of you use it, um, we use it certainly at Kanos, uh, it's a cloud-based team collaboration tool, it was valued at over a billion dollars within just over a year of launching. That's kind of incredible. In April last year, the company raised 160 million in funding. In April this year, it announced it had raised another $200 million in funding. So the rapid adoption of cloud has made access to IT capacity inexpensive and massively scalable. And what that's created is the opportunity for tech-savvy startups to become what are being called micro-multinationals, where traditional business would have taken years to grow from being a local business to becoming a national business to become a multinational conglomerate. Actually, they can very quickly gain worldwide attention with only a handful of employees and cause major market disruption. So perhaps inevitably, digital disruption is being felt in boardrooms across the world. Technology is obviously now the epicenter of change, and according to a survey of CEOs, it's the biggest external influence on companies today. A study by Capgemini last year suggested that 27% of senior executives now rate digital transformation as being a matter of survival. And of course, that's only going to increase. There is no company that is too small or too large to be unaffected by the forces of digital disruption. But how well a business is responding? Well, seemingly not very well. Since 2000, 52% of companies in the Fortune 500 have either gone bankrupt, been acquired, or ceased to exist. The effects of digital disruption have been extraordinarily swift and brutal, and you only have to look at the list of high street names that have fallen. Kodak, Blockbusters, Woolworths, Polaroid, Borders, British Home Stores, all gone. Research indicates that nearly three quarters of companies only respond to digital disruption in, the, in their market in the second year of its starting. And those companies that do respond often recognise it late, and when they do respond, they're failing to act boldly enough to be able to adapt to the new market environment. So what do businesses need to do in order to survive? Before we run through that, it's worth taking a moment to reflect on what makes for a successful business in a digital age. And I've got a couple of definitions here for you to consider. What is clear from reading these through is that organisational agility is the key to success. I guess the question is, how do you start? OK, so drawing from the lessons of some of the most successful companies in the world, it is actually possible to start to identify some of the most vital steps that businesses need to take. Combined, these steps, these seven steps that I've outlined here, can help transform your business and ensure your survival. And most of these, I think it's fair to say, are second nature to internet era companies. But they can be a real significant challenge to established organisations with deeply embedded processes and a culture that's resistant to change. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through each of these in turn, but ask yourself as we go through them whether or not your company is actually taking action to address each of these areas. Let's start in the centre. We know that a focus on customer needs is at the heart of the best digital organisations in the world. You only have to look at Amazon. It's got over 300 million active user accounts, and it receives about 4 million 
unique site visits per day. And Amazon's number one leadership principle? Customer obsession. I've got a few quotes here from Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos. We're not competitor obsessed, we're customer obsessed. We start with what the customer needs and we work backwards. Don't just listen to your customers, understand them. Everyone has to be able to work in a call center. Focusing on the customer makes a company more resilient. And don't settle for 99%. We're not satisfied until it's 100%. Respect your customer for today, because if you make a customer unhappy in the physical world, they might each tell six people. In an online world, they can each tell 6,000. Strive to be a customer-centric company. And what he says is if we can arrange things in such a way that our interests are aligned to our customers, then in the long term that will work out really well for our customers and it will work out really well for Amazon. That seems to be working okay for him. He also says, don't be afraid to apologise and use the scar tissue from painful mistakes to help make better decisions going forward. A lot of that you'll recognise in the Agile philosophy. So customer focus is about understanding your customer needs, really understanding them, and organising your people, your processes, and your technology to meet them. And keep in mind that your customers are using digital channels like social media to communicate their likes, their dislikes, and their preferences about products and services. The question to ask yourself is, are you listening? To survive, every business must now be able to rapidly update services in response to changing needs or disruption from market competitors. And there's an interesting example in McDonald's. Um, we all know McDonald's, the largest restaurant chain in the world. It's got more than 34,000 restaurants. It employs 1.8 million people. McDonald's has recognized the massive shift in consumer behavior and is trying to adapt by digitally transforming its service experience and company processes. For example, last year McDonald's began installing kiosks where customers can quickly customize their hamburgers. They were also one of the first companies to adopt Apple Pay for contactless payments. For last year's Super Bowl, McDonald's used social media to give away products related to commercials they aired throughout the game. And what that meant is they had to reconfigure their internal operational processes and create a new digital newsroom with a cross-functional team, which included members of their marketing and legal divisions, their advertising agencies, and even Twitter employees. And they just didn't operate that way. Actually, they got over 1.2 million retweets. And apparently, uh, amongst those retweets was somebody called Taylor Swift, who I'm told is a singer of some repute. Um, so clearly, user-centered design, agile development, and continuous delivery are essential to being able to respond rapidly to a changing business environment. Service agility is key. So web analytics actually give businesses access to real-time data like never before. It's now possible to track and predict customer behavior in huge detail, providing the opportunity to actually make better, more informed decisions about investing in new products and service improvements. Probably the obvious example here is Netflix, the world's leading internet television network. It's got 83 million members in over 180 countries watching more than 125 million hours of TV shows and movies every day. Netflix collects and exploits huge amounts of data. Just to give you a flavor of actually what they capture. They capture data on when you pause, rewind, or fast forward what day you watch content, the date you watch content, what time you watch, where you watch, the device you use to watch, when you pause or leave content, and if you ever come back, the ratings that are given, of which there are about four million a day, the searches that are conducted, of which there are about three million a day, and your browsing and scrolling behavior of your mouse. And it uses this data to drive hugely complex algorithms that can predict behavior, make viewing recommendations, and that enables them to invest in new TV programs. And in fact, that's how they came about making House of Cards. 
Netflix data philosophy, philosophy offers us, I think, probably three lessons. First, that data should be accessible, easy to discover, and easy to process for everybody. Whether your data set is large or small, being able to visualize it makes it easier to explain. And then thirdly, the longer you take to find the data, the less valuable it becomes. So the message there is to tap into the wealth of data from digital services and use it to drive your business decisions. And don't forget that you can also tap into your own company data to transform your internal services and improve employee satisfaction as well. It doesn't have to purely be about your external services. So increasingly, customers expect that the digital tools and channels they prefer will be mirrored by the companies they choose. Organisations need not only to get comfortable with new technology, but actually become infatuated by the advantages it can bring. And probably a good example here is Burberry. Uh, Burberry leads brands in its use of technology in the, in the luxury brand industry. And it's been amongst the first to test uh, and use new social media channels and developments. Uh, Burberry jumped on Snapchat and Periscope when they first arrived. It tested Instagram's video ads and it used Twitter buy buttons as they rolled out. Two years ago, Burberry upgraded its mobile site, which resulted in it tripling its, tripling its mobile revenue. Its, re its flagship Regent Street store is actually got technology woven throughout the architecture of the building. It's got a digitally enabled gallery, it's got 500 speakers, it's got 100 screens, including the tallest indoor retail screen in the world. It also uses radio frequency identification woven into selected items of clothing and accessories to assist with stock and quality control. It also is able to trigger bespoke multimedia content relevant to the products that it's got available in the store. And it uses mirrors that can turn instantly into screens with runway footage of fashion events uh, streamed live via satellite. So it's become truly omni-channel in its approach so that the service experience is consistent no matter which channel you choose to use. And every, every business needs to aspire in the same way. So to survive, businesses need to maximise their use of technology and such as tools like collaboration tools, and continually explore the opportunities presented by new technologies if they're going to stay ahead of their competitors. I think it's fair to say that continuous innovation doesn't happen by chance. It requires a systematic approach. I guess Apple, obviously the world's largest IT company, the second largest mobile phone manufacturer, is arguably one of the most innovative companies in the world. Obviously, it's changed mobile phones through the iPhone, which set new industry standards. It changed the music business through iPod and iTunes, and it's now got Apple Music with 15 million subscribers. And it's changed the, the software business model, in fact, with the App Store using third-party apps rather than providing all the software itself. And these innovations came about by design. For example, Apple introduced an initiative called Blue Sky to give employees two weeks out of their normal schedule of work to focus on special projects. Today's businesses need to take a methodical approach to incentivizing, encouraging, and evaluating new ideas and invest in giving people time and space to explore new initiatives if it's going to continue to innovate. So in the new digital economy, the war for digital talent is underway. Mergers and acquisitions targeting digital agencies, ad tech companies, and analytics firms have surged worldwide through the first half of this year. If you just take IBM, just for an example, in February this year alone, it bought three digital advertising and design companies in a week. It's now created a 10,000 strong digital agency, IBM Interactive Experience. 
Every business now needs to attract and retain talent with the skills needed to support development and delivery of digital services. And to compete, organisations must recruit in new digital ways. It's an increasingly in-demand talent pool and actually is an increasingly fluid job market. And this applies top-down as well. Digital transformation requires digital savvy leadership. I guess the question to ask is, does your board know it's Snapchat from its WhatsApp? Finally, to survive the demands of a digital environment requires a culture of experimentation. And I guess Google are a really good example here. And although they've now discontinued it, discontinued it and replaced it with a new approach, it created Google Labs to demonstrate and test new projects. Obviously, Google Labs was described as a playground where more adventurous users could play around with prototypes of some of our wild and crazy ideas and offer feedback directly to the engineers who developed them. A real experimentational culture. Famously, obviously, it was introduced the 70-20-10 model where 70% of projects were dedicated to the core business, 20% were related and 10% were unrelated. And I think it's fair to say Google strives to maintain the sort of open culture that's associated with startups, in which everyone is a sort of hands-on contributor and feels comfortable with sharing ideas and opinions. They've designed their offices and cafes to reflect that and encourage interactions of Googlers between and within across teams to spark conversations not just about work but also about play. And similarly, digital businesses need to actively encourage and reward experimentation too. This means being comfortable and challenging the status quo and actually being brave enough to change the business model if the market conditions require it. I'm going to leave you with a final thought. There is only one wrong move when it comes to digital transformation, and that's not to make any move at all. Failing to adapt to the changes in your environment can clearly be fatal, and there's a track record to prove it. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>